Bible this morning and turn over to Matthew chapter 15. If you find your place there in Matthew chapter 15. Pastor Ethan made uh, reference to it earlier in the service, but we certainly are thankful for the good uh, all-nighter. took a lot of planning and a lot of work, really, to get that. You may see some extra uh, trash on the floor or uh, some seats out of line, as we did have them in here. We didn't play any games in here, but uh, just the nature of having 75 or 80 teens in here for preaching time. Uh, it was exciting to see. The kids had a great time. They, uh, I believe, represented us well, though half the kids were not from our church. I mean, the other half were just outsiders. Uh, but we, I believe, had a good opportunity for a testimony over at the place where we were. And then we, of course, saw five uh, decisions, and they seemed like really solid uh, kids that were interested. A couple of them, those were assurance, and then some kids that had never been here before that made salvation decisions. And so I know some of you prayed for that, and that's really the goal. The goal was to, of course, be a blessing to our kids and challenge and help them, but ultimately to reach some folks through it, through it as well. So we're thankful how that went. Appreciate the work that uh, Nina and Pastor Ethan put into that. A lot of background and stuff that goes into to making that happen. As you find your place in Matthew chapter 15, I'm going to read a text here, a little uh, place where Jesus interacted with a, with a woman that was a Gentile, which is a little different than what we normally see. So we'll read that text here in just a moment. Before we do, let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in this service. And we're brought back to the fact that apart from you, we could do nothing. We believe it's important now as we open the Word of God that, Lord, you would move in, that you would speak to us and challenge our hearts. Lord, we know that already you've been glorified and honored through the music that's been given, but we pray now that the Word of God would do its work, that it would lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, that every heart would be challenged and helped. And we thank you for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look down to Matthew chapter 15, and I'll begin reading in verse 21, it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan. Now, of course, this is a woman who is a Gentile, and she's from the land of Canaan. So a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy, O me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Well, he answered her not a word. And the disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. So she didn't ask him just once. She was following him and and kept asking, Jesus, my daughter is vexed with a devil. Thou son of David, will you not help me? And the disciples said, Can't you get rid of this woman? They just wanted to send her away. Well, he answered and said, and he's saying it to the woman, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, then she, uh, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And then almost a, a smile comes across the face of Jesus, and he looks at the woman and answered and said, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You know, perhaps the outsider would come and watch the Lord Jesus Christ as he interacts with this woman of Canaan. The disciples certainly didn't understand everything that was taking place. This woman of Canaan, who was from Tyre and Sidon, which of course were known, Jesus used them as an example of a place where he, uh, similarly to Sodom and Gomorrah, He said if the people in Tyre and Sidon had received the preaching of Jesus, uh, they would have lasted and so forth. And it would be more tolerable uh, in judgment. So there was a place of great wickedness and certainly people that were far from God. But this woman came to Jesus with a, a desperate need and came and asked him. And maybe you would expect, well, she came and asked Jesus, uh, why didn't he just turn and uh, help her with her need? But he didn't answer her at all. But then when he finally did answer He answered very matter-of-factly and said, Look, uh, I have not come to help Gentiles. I have come to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, she didn't give up. She worshiped him. Lord, you've got to help me. He said, Well, now, it wouldn't be fitting if I took the children's bread. What I have for them, he's using that analogy, if I took the children's food and let them go hungry and fed a dog with it. And she could have almost taken that. Well, you are calling me a dog? That's what Jews call Gentiles. 
you'd almost think she'd have stomped her foot, walked off, said, I don't need this. I haven't been treated this way. And, but she didn't. She said, I believe he's got what I need. And you know what? She found it. And we know when Jesus ended this conversation, surely the goal, the result, what he was looking for the whole time was to give this woman the truth. Now, you know, we live in certainly, I think, unarguably, an ungodly culture. I mean, things, as far as culturally, have degraded significantly over the years. From when I was a child and when some of you were a child, back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth and so forth, I mean, we have seen things degrade and go down. Things that perhaps, I mean, I've even had conversations in recent days, things that are not only accepted today, but required. Not just that we would say, well, I'm willing to put up with it. No, you've got to embrace it or you're considered on the other side. That is a very deep cultural shift. So you say, well, we're believers in the Lord Jesus. God changes our life. He lines us up with this book, and we begin to live a different life. And, of course, God has made us new, and we've got things that we don't do anymore. We ought to be talking different from the world and uh, being entertained different than the world and so forth. But the question is, when God radically changes us, makes us different, well, then we become to interact with this world, and we want to reach them with the gospel. Well, you know, some have erringly thought that if a church is going to be effective in reaching a cultural uh, uh, group of people that are culturally low, that, that have shifted away from the Bible, that we've got to find a middle ground. That is, we've got to find a place that maybe they're not so uh, confronted with, not so taken back. I mean, if we try to live too holy and if we try to hold the banner too high, man, people are so far from God, they're going to say, man, I'm just going to be turned off by that. Well, you know, here's a woman that was a woman from Canaan. Jesus gives her the truth. And I'll point out to you, everything he said now, what he told her was absolutely true. He didn't mince words. What he told her was very confrontational, and he did not soft soap it. He didn't try to make it appeal a little bit better, and he didn't come across and say, well, you know, right now I've got a little bit of way to do this. I don't want to turn this Gentile woman off. Is there any question in our mind today that he loved the woman from Canaan? No, we know he did. That's why he said, woman, Great is thy faith. You've just demonstrated to these unbelieving Jews that I've been walking with for years, and I wanted to show them something. I wanted them to see something, and what did he want them to see but the power of the truth? You know, you say, well, how are we going to reach an ungodly culture? I mean, you know, back in the day, maybe you go back to the 50s or 60s, and and the world and the church weren't quite as far apart. Uh, In their heart, they were. But I mean, culturally, maybe there were some similarities. And so, you know, they walk into a church service and they hear people sing hymns and they hear uh, somebody stand in the, preach the Bible and, and, and hold the standard high and maybe preach against some of the, uh, the world wouldn't even have been taken back uh, 50 years ago to hear somebody preach against immorality and adultery and homosexuality and drunkenness and so forth. But if we, if we really confront them with that now, they'd be so turned off, they won't listen. But you know, I got confidence today. And I believe that the way you reach an ungodly world is the same way you've always reached it, the truth. Now, I see in this passage, and we'll get to it as well, an attitude that the disciples took. They looked at it and said, These, that woman's just from Canaan, just send her away. So you do have both extremes. You've got some that simply bury their head in the sand and say, let the culture's gone where it is. No way you're going to ever reach them. There's nothing we can do to help them. We just wait until Jesus comes, totally focused on ourselves and not looking outside. Some says, well, no, we've got to compromise with them to reach them. But I believe we ought to do it just like Jesus did and confront them head on. Now, I notice in this passage that Jesus here demonstrates to us, though, though the truth may be unpleasant, it's effective. Now, notice, first of all, we read it in the text, we've got here a perplexing denial. I mean, even if you read the passage, aren't you a little bit perplexed and realize how this woman would feel when here she comes and says, Jesus, thou son of David, my daughter has a need, and I know you're in the business of helping people with a need. And he did not even answer. I mean, he just kept walking. I mean, other people would come to him, I, I need help. Do you remember the blind man sitting next? He says, thou son of David, help me, have mercy on me. And it stopped Jesus in his tracks. He went over and healed him of his blindness. Here this Canaanite woman comes and says, thou son of David, have mercy. And he answered her not a word. Now, maybe you've wondered before. 
I've called upon God, and I'm looking for help. I'm looking for some direction. And maybe you don't think you've gotten it, but Jesus now is dealing with this woman on a very definite level, and that level is the truth. You know, the first thing I think about her is this woman, being from Canaan, he denied her because of her curse. Do you know back in Genesis, uh, Ham's son, of course, was cursed by God. Now, it wasn't him individually as much as the fact that his nation would be cursed. And what do we see in the book of Joshua? But God goes into Canaan land, and he says, this nation is cursed. They've already sinned against me for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Judgment has come. Uh, I predicted it would be the case, and it has. And Canaan was a cursed land. They had inherited the curse. Now, all of them didn't get completely wiped out. They lived nearby. They were still in that same geographical area. But Jews looked at Canaanites as a cursed people, and frankly, God had said, yes, cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be. So these people that lived in the Canaan land that were defeated, she was part of that group. But let me tell you that we ourselves, as human beings, all of us without exception, have inherited a curse. The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so that death passed upon all men, forget it, all have sinned. Do you realize when Adam sinned, all of us were in Adam in the sense he's a father of the whole human race, and God says the whole human race now has been cast into a nature to do wrong. Psalm 58, 3 says the wicked are estranged from the womb. They go aside as soon as they be born, speaking lies. I mean, the fact is we are born with a nature to sin. We're born to do wrong. The Bible tells us there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I mean, you take a little small child. You don't uh, ever try to uh, teach him anything bad. Don't teach him how to steal. Don't teach him how to lie. Uh, Don't teach him how to be mean to people. But also don't teach him anything good. Just keep him very neutral. Just teach him how to eat. Uh, Maybe just teach him how to take care of himself. And you say, well, wouldn't 50% of the kids turn out bad and 50% of them would turn out good? No, I'll tell you what, every one of them will turn out bad. You don't have to be taught to steal, lie, cheat. You have to be taught not to. And just teaching them not to is not enough. God's got to change them on the inside because we have a nature to sin. You say, well, that kind of makes me feel like I'm off the hook a little bit. I mean, after all, I didn't ask for that. This woman didn't ask to be born in, in Canaan. But you know, the Canaanites were not only cursed ahead of time. In other words, God predicted, here's where Canaan's going to go. Cursed be Canaan. But if they'd have ever thought to themselves, well, you know, how can we help it? God put us back here uh, years ago, said, cursed be Canaan. Uh, God's going to come in here and destroy us. Nothing we can do about it. But they didn't just inherit the curse. They proved out that they deserved it. See, they initiated it. They did things in that day. Of course, God said, when God never said, I'm going to go in and destroy Canaan because I cursed it. He said, I'm going to go in and destroy Canaan because the earth is going to vomit them up. He said, I'm going to go in and destroy Canaan because they've done unbelievable wickedness and their their fullness of their iniquity has come to a full and they've got to be destroyed. But let me tell you a similarity in our lives. Somebody says, well, we inherited our sin nature. It's not my fault. It was Adam's fault. Well, even if you didn't have that uh, inheritance, you've initiated the curse. The Bible says in Galatians 3.11, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Now, somebody might make an argument today, and they might say, well, look, I am not really what you'd call a bad person. And that's a subjective term, right? So I'm not really a bad person. I mean, and then they could illustrate it. They say, I've got a, a guy next to me, lives right beside me, and he cheats on his spouse. I've never done that. Two houses down from that, and I'm not talking about my own neighborhood. I'm just saying it could be. But two houses down from that, there's a guy on drugs. I don't do drugs. The guy across the street, he don't even work. He's lazy, bum, uh, sops off, off, and I don't do that. I work hard. Now, all of those statements may be true, but the problem is you're comparing yourself to others. God says, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. You know how many lies it would take today to make you a liar? Just one. You're a liar. You told a lie. Well, I mean, surely everybody's, at some point, you're right. We've all come short of the glory of God, and just like this woman, we can relate. 
she came and was denied because of the curse. Now, you say, God would deny me? Your sin separates you from God. I mean, God's got every legitimate right not to listen to you, not to let you into heaven, not to have a thing in the world to do with you because of one sin you've ever committed. I mean, God's holy. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. I can't come into his presence, and God legitimately could keep me separated from him forever because of my curse. So I'm just like this woman. But you know, she not only got denied because of the curse, she also got denied because of a character. He said, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Now, we're bad enough on our own. I mean, we're bad enough failing with sin and so forth, just out of selfishness and sin nature and so forth. But there's also a character involved. That's the devil. You say, well, you don't really believe the devil is a real person, do you? He'd love for you to think he's not a real person. But I'll guarantee you he is a fallen angel that God describes in the Bible that has a very definite purpose in mind, and that purpose is to make sure that you go to hell. You see, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, calling him what he is, the God of this world with a little g. He is the God of this present age, this present uh, uh, culture that God has allowed this earth to take control of, that he says, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. This problem this woman has, she said, the whole reason I'm coming is, yes, I'm from a cursed race, and yes, the devil has given me problems. Could you not help me, son of David, I'm asking you? And she asked a good question. She said, I want mercy. But you know, not only because of the, the curse, she had Canaan and the character of the devil, but here's the real issue. Her problem, the reason she was denied, was because of her claim. She said, thou son of David... Have mercy on me. Do you know as a Gentile, she didn't have any claim on the son of David. See, the son of David is Jesus' uh, royal pedigree. Now, she's not a Jew. There's only one group of people that can look to the son of David as their king and to say he's going to come from that line and sit on the throne of Jerusalem. Now, I view him today as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Certainly, I know he will sit on that literal throne, and he will be there, and his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. But as a claim, everybody Jesus came, and that's what he meant when I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His first mission, that wasn't mean he didn't come to save the world, but his mission as king was first of all presented to his own people. You say, well, that's just such a small little thing. I mean, she said, son of David, Jesus knew what she meant. He's bound to know she was sincere. I mean, he had to realize that she really just wanted mercy. What difference did she make if she said son of David? The difference is, when you come to Jesus, you got to claim him the right way. Now, get me, it's not the words. Words are not the issue. The truth is at stake. There's plenty of folks today to say, well, I believe there's many ways to God. I mean, everybody knows. I mean, God, if you were to come to him and just say, God, help me, but you don't know how he's going to help you. That's insufficient. So, well, God knows my heart. He knows I'm doing the best I can. I'm trying. I mean, I, I, I try to be a good person, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm going through these steps, and you might even go through religious steps. Well, yeah, I mean, I know Jesus has got something to do with it. Jesus is part of it, but then I'm part of it too. Let me tell you, God's going to deny you until you find out the way that he accepts. Now, there's several aspects about this claim you need to understand. When you come to God, first of all, you've got to come on God's terms. What are his terms? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I remember having a conversation back when I was a teenager, and I've had this conversation with many people since, but it was the first time I'd ever... As a Christian, I started getting interested in, in, in people being saved, and I was trying to talk to this guy, and I didn't really know how to articulate this. But he explained to me when I told him the gospel, and I said, well, look, Jesus died on, your, on the cross for your sin. He came out of the grave, and he's willing to save you, and he already heard that before. But he said, but it can't be that easy. It just can't be that simple. You're telling me that I do nothing, that all I'm doing is simply asking Jesus to save me, and then it's totally up to him, and I don't have any part of it? And I didn't know how to articulate it, but I said, well, that's kind of what it sounds like to me. I mean, you, what can you do? 
Well, he couldn't grasp it. He couldn't get that. Many times I've had that conversation before. You say, well, that sounds well-meaning to me. It sounds like a person has good intentions. Look, I know Jesus died for me. And I believe that's so high and holy and such a wonderful sacrifice. I've got to earn it somehow. I mean, somehow or another, you know God expects me to do this and this and this to keep up with it. Well, just what do you have to do to earn it? If you go to church every Sunday, would that earn it? But I guarantee you, you'd make an excuse and say, well, I had a good reason for missing this one or this one. So you'd still come short. You say, but if I never again say a cuss word, would that do it? Well, what if you missed it once or twice? You, you, you still got to answer, right? Well, if I never thought a dirty thought, would that do it? What, would, you, would you be able to do that? See, the, fa- the fact is, you couldn't earn it anyway. And if you try, you're not doing it on God's terms. Now, don't get me wrong. You come with a heart that says, I'm willing to let God do those things. You come with a heart that says, yeah, I realize when I take Jesus, he's going to make me a new creature. He'll change me. Yes, you have an attitude, I don't want my sin, but many think, many think they can add a religious element into it, and they're not on God's terms. It is by grace you are saved through faith. That not of yourselves. You've got to come on his terms. Well, somebody grasped that, and they said, okay, I get it. I come just as I am. I know I've got to be saved. That's God's terms. I can't add to it. I know I've got to receive Jesus, but I know that when I receive him, he's going to change me and make me different. Well, that's what repentance is about, isn't it? A change of mind. Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. So you know the second aspect you've got to come to him on is God's timing. You know, plenty of people intend on being saved. Very few people that have any understanding of the cross recognize they're on their way to hell, recognize Jesus is willing to save them, recognize even the fact that I can't save myself, Jesus has got to do it. But the second lie the devil says is you're right, just do it tomorrow. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, there's only one day you can be saved. Matter of fact, there's only one hour you can be saved. In fact, let's let's narrow it down. There's only one minute in which you can be saved. Let's go a little bit further. There's really only one second in which you can be saved right now. Because you're not guaranteed you got another one. You don't know for sure how much more time you have. So God's timing is right now. Plenty of folks have said, well, I recognize what Jesus did. I have good thoughts about it. I'm glad he did. And sometime or another, eventually, maybe. Now, God is a gracious God. I could do a show of hands. I won't do it. How many of you put him off several times before you finally said, okay, now? Thank God he was gracious to you, and thank God he was gracious to me. But you're not guaranteed that. You've got to come on his terms You've got to come with his timing. But you know, you've got to come mainly with his truth. John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, people struggle over this idea that there's one way to heaven. Now, if we just backed away from our sentimentality, if we backed away from our own human thinking and looked at it just rationally, and by the way, rational is not always the go-to. You go to the Word of God first, And then it'll make you rational. But let's just take it from a rational standpoint. And we said, okay, there's one God, which there is. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. God didn't make two ways to him. That just makes sense. There's only one way. If I have another way, it's a man-made way. You know, a preacher went to, uh, was talking one time in a, he, in, a, in a lecture, and a lady had listened, and she actually was a well-known Ph.D., highly educated, religious teacher of a false religion. It was a so-called Christian denomination, but she was completely liberal, didn't believe the Bible was the Word of God, didn't believe Jesus was the Son of God. She thought he was a great teacher and an important you know, historical character, typical liberal type person, highly educated, but religious. Well, she listened to this Uh, other preacher who also himself was educated in his own right, but he was a stark believer of God's word and the gospel. She came up to him afterwards, probably because she had been maybe struck by what he said. And she, in a friendly manner, tried to discuss with him, well, look, I understand, you know, what you've said, but I take issue with part of that. 
You, you basically said there's only one way to heaven, no other way, that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved no matter what country you live in, no matter what culture you're from, no matter what background. You know, I really think you're, you're being very narrow in that. I think that really that's unreasonable. So he asked her, well, what do you emphasize when you talk to people? How do you tell them to get to God? She said, oh, well, to me, I emphasize God is love. Well, now the Bible says, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. So he asked her a question that she had a hard time answering. Where do you get the idea that God is love? He reminded her. He says, now, if you look at the heathen deities, let's just use Zeus, Aphrodite, Mercury, Greek gods or whatever, people that believe in those Greek gods, they never came to a conclusion that they loved them. They weren't taught that they loved them. You better appease them. You better do what they say or they'll bring the hammer down on you. What about uh, Muhammad and, and Allah? The, the, that's not, they don't teach God as love. They teach you better worship Allah and you better make other people worship him or you'll be judged. That's where it's coming from. He went over several heathen deities and different religions. He said this is true in all people that have a deity. All of them before the Bible before it influenced them, none of them taught God is love. He says, so where do you get God is love? She said, oh, I get it from the Bible. He said, but there is no other source except that. And she agreed, that's right, that's the only source. He said, well, if that Bible says God is love and you believe it, the same Bible says Jesus is the only way to heaven. You can't take part and throw out the other. The same Bible that taught you God is love and you can't find it out anywhere else. That's the only place it's ever come from. It's the same one that says there's only one way, none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. When this woman came to Jesus and said, thou son of David, well, why couldn't he have just lowered his standard and said, well, I know what she means, because God doesn't lower his standard. Now, he loved this woman. He didn't cast her out. He wasn't done with her. So get me today, you may have tried to come to God, and you say, well, I, I think I can come as a, uh, because I'm a Baptist. Uh, well, it's okay, God will save Baptists too, all right? Or I've tried to get there as a Methodist or a Catholic or a Lutheran, or I just feel like I'm going to be okay, and it didn't work. God's still interested in you, but you've got to come His way. See, I, you got, when you read this passage, there is a perplexity, a perplexing denial. Jesus wouldn't answer. But it drove her to look for the truth. Now, I see, secondly, the discourse. Notice the persuasion now of this discourse. We read it in the text, but notice in verse 23, he answered her not a word. Well, then his disciples came and besought him and said, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, you know, the first thing I notice about the discourse, and it certainly gets our attention, is the silence. You know, not much when somebody comes to Jesus and asks him for mercy, is he silent? Now, we know, first and foremost, he's silent because she had the wrong claim. You can't call on me as the son of David. That's a Jewish thing. There's another way. You approach me properly. Well, she didn't get it till he gave her a hint, but his silence got her attention. You know what the silence did? She began to ask more and more as it brought her to a place of emptiness. You know, if God doesn't help you, who is? When you come to that place, you're actually in a pretty good place because you'll seek for every other way to do it, and he's the only one that can help you. It gave her an emptiness in her soul. You know, the Bible says over in uh, James 1.26, it says, pure religion and undefiled is this, to help the widows and orphans, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That is a pure religion in contrast with a false religion. You know, false religion brings people to a place of emptiness. Someone realizes, you know, I need to, uh, I need to get my, my family on track. Maybe we need to start attending a church, and that's a very generic term in people's minds. Um, I'm having some struggles in my life. My marriage has trouble, or my kids are, or I just, for character's sake, we need to do better. Hey, that's a good idea. That's actually a great thing you ought to do, and that's wonderful, but there's a lot of options out there, isn't there? Now, by no means would I stand up and say the only option is this particular church. You understand that's not the point, but what is an option is you better find a Bible-believing, 
uh, Jesus promoting, uh, eternally settled, that follows this book, place to go and learn. Because religion will leave you empty. See, religion's God's biggest enemy. All the enemies of Jesus, the Pharisees, that are listening and so forth, always willing to attack, they were religious people. Well, this woman had sought him now, and she used religious terminology. See, son of David, where'd she get that from? She's a woman of Canaan. They didn't worship Jehovah. They didn't believe the Bible. They didn't believe the Jewish religion. She wasn't even on a Samaritan level. She is just totally an, a, a heathen who knew nothing about God. But you know what she had noticed? She'd noticed somebody saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped right in his tracks and he helped her. So she said, Oh, well, if that's all you got to do, Thou son of David, help me. But it didn't work for her. Well, what she didn't understand was just using religious terminology doesn't mean a thing. It's got to be based on the truth. You know, how many people know when you mention Jesus died on the cross, that's wonderful that you know that. But do you know who it was that died? Who is this one who went on the cross? He wasn't just a martyr. He wasn't just somebody who was there who uh, set a great example for us. He wasn't just somebody there that made us feel sentimental because he's willing to die. That was the Son of God who came for the purpose of taking your sin upon himself and bearing it. She had the religious language. It meant nothing. Jesus wanted her to know it. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 7, 22, it ought to arrest your attention. Many shall say unto me in that day, the day of standing before God, many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and done many wonderful works? And then I will profess to them, I never knew you. So you don't just need to know language. You need to know God. She was empty. But the disciples also interest me. When, they, when Jesus wouldn't answer, you know what the disciples said? Jesus, can't you get rid of this woman? Now, that here's the picture I see. This woman approaches Jesus Says, thou son of David, have mercy. The disciples said, oh, okay, here's another miracle Jesus is going to do. Let's give him time. But he didn't answer. They scratched their head. Man, that's, uh, Jesus must not like these Gentiles either. <laughs> I thought he might. I mean, we don't. We call them dogs. We're not interested in them. So it really wasn't that surprising. Yeah, Jesus is one of us. He don't like these folks either. And this woman's coming and asking him, say, look, but Jesus, can you get rid of her? We're tired of, tired of listening. Well, Jesus says as if he's talking to his disciples, but he says it so the woman will hear. Because really, by truth, she's separated from God. She has no, but God said it to make sure she heard it. Well, you say, well, that's good. He's going to tell these disciples. He's going to explain. Uh, I really would like to help this woman. I love her, and I'd like to have her come. I don't want her to feel too bad about being a Gentile. If she would just change one word, that wasn't the issue. Now, what he said to her almost seemed more harsh than not answering at all. I didn't come to help these old Gentiles. I came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But you know what it was? It was the truth. Now, the truth that we're not going to take time to explain this morning. It'd take a while. The truth is they're going to reject the Messiah. He's going to turn to the Gentiles and the church will be established, which is, doesn't get predicted to the next chapter in chapter 16. He's going to save far more Gentiles than he ever did Jews because of their response. There was a day, even if that hadn't happened, he already predicted one day the Gentiles would trust him. But it seemed harsh. But it was exactly what she needed to hear. You see, this woman uh, herself was empty, but the disciples, they were short-sighted. You know what their conclusion was? Get rid of her. Now, two sides. Today, uh, some people look and they say, well, if we're going to reach this old ungodly world, I mean, let's just face it, the morality of, of people around us has is, is sunk low. I mean, the stuff that's accepted today, not only accepted, not just tolerated, but basically you're required to follow along with it all. I mean, just the whole gamut of the, of the immorality, starting off from uh, just sexual immorality and, and fornication all the way up to the, uh, the gender changes and so forth. That's just one category, but that's pretty low. So you say, here we come, and we offer life in Jesus, and we, you know, we sing hymns to Jesus, and we believe the Bible, and God changes us and changes our, our way of life, and how are we going to reach them? The other side says, we're just not interested in them at all. 
they're just so wicked and vile and ungodly. And I'm talking about all the way from the gamut of your thieves to the, uh, the proud CEO at a company who's trying to make money and cares nothing about God and everywhere in between. But they say, look, we got it. They don't. That's all that matters. That's what the disciples were saying. We don't need that old Canaanite woman. Curse, get rid of her. Let's just go on and have our... Both were wrong. Jesus said, no, you know what she needs? The truth. You know how to reach a well-refined, educated, uh, high-character, hard-working person who just doesn't know Jesus? You preach the gospel to them. You know how to reach an old low-down sinner who might come from a house of ill repute or be strung out on drugs? You know how you reach them? You preach the gospel to them. The gospel is the power of God. So here the uh, the, the disciples are short-sighted because of this silence. But here's the key, the source of the discourse. Because this is a very little phrase, but very important. But he answered in verse 24 and said. Now, he is silent to begin with. She didn't know what to do. Jesus answered and said. Let me tell you whatever's next after it says Jesus answered and said is the word of God. Because Jesus said it. Now, I am not Jesus, but I can quote what he said. And by the way, the first thing he ever said to us was not in the first chapter of Matthew. It was in the first chapter of Genesis. Any of this book is God's word. Now, there's certain parts that meet the need at a certain hour. But what we need is the word of God. He answered and said, you know, the word of God is like a fire and a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. I mean, you know it will not return void. I mean, what Jesus said to her, the word of God will do the work. Now, the substance of the discourse was very strong. Look at verse 24. He said, I am not sent, but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In verse 26, he answered and said, it's not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to dogs. Now, that was, that was strong. I mean, that, that wasn't uh, soft soap in it. That wasn't appeasing it. That was difficult. You know, you might feel uncomfortable sometimes when I preach the Bible and you think, well, man, there might be some people in here today who are drunkards and he's up there preaching on drunkenness. Now, my conclusion is not you just need to give up your drinking, but my conclusion is your drunkenness demonstrates you need Jesus. Man, he's up there uh, preaching today against some cultural, all this cultural immorality and stuff. Boy, that might make some folks uncomfortable. It might turn them off. Listen, the Bible is the truth. You preach the truth. Now, if I'm wrong, if I'm preaching a conclusion and I'm just saying reform, turn over a new leaf, uh, if I'm just there to condemn you, if I'm just there to hold it over your head, then I'm wrong. But if I preach the truth, I don't just mean me. I mean, if the the truth is preached, you say, well, isn't that going to turn people off? Some people got to be turned off or they get turned on. You got to get people lost before they can be saved. I mean, Jesus is telling this woman something that could have shocked her. Could have said, I'm done with anybody who called me that. But it had the opposite effect. Now, if I offend you, that's a problem. I hopefully can keep from offending you personally. Personally, I can't understand anybody nice as me and humble as I am why you would be offended by me personally. But if I, my personality does, then I need to work on it. If my demeanor is bad, I need to work on that. If I get this holier-than-thou, look-down-my-nose attitude and so forth, and that turns people off, that's a problem. But if the truth offends people, ultimately it does not drive them away. The only thing that will draw them is the truth. You say, man, that seems backward. That's typically how God works, isn't it? His ways are not our ways. Now, I'm going to have to move along here, but I'm going to prove to you how that works. Because look down here. When he told her this, I mean a powerful statement. This was like telling her, uh, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You're a drunkard, you need to get right with God. Uh, Flee fornication, every sin that a man doeth is without the body. He that committeth fornication sitteth against his own body. You need to get right with God. Let no filthy communication proceed out of your mouth. All liars shall have their mark in a lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of in the day. You need to get right with God. strong. I mean, he's telling her, you are not fit to come to me because you're a Canaanite. So she's going to walk away and stomp off and be done, right? The Bible says in verse 25, she came and worshipped him. 
saying, what's the next word? Lord. Hmm. 1 Corinthians 12, 3. No man can call Jesus accursed by the Holy Ghost, and no man can call him Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Only by the Spirit of God, she changed her terminology. He didn't explain it to her, but evidently the Holy Ghost did. She didn't call him Son of David. Now she dropped on her knees and said, Lord. Well, now he's got her attention. He's not silent anymore. He said, okay, you just said the right word. Now, do you recognize that you're nothing but a dog? Now, he don't mean dog like we would think of it, but he's saying what, these, what you are in the position of a Gentile, do you recognize it? And I like what her first word was, truth. Truth, Lord, you said it. I'm going to tell you when you're going to come to Jesus today, when God tells you that your sin's wicked, that's separated from him, and you don't excuse it, you don't try to make it, say it's something that's not, but you say, truth, Lord. Nobody's ever come to Jesus that didn't say, I am a sinner, and I'm in need of a Savior. You don't come up alongside God, you find him at his feet. She said, truth, Lord, yet, and boy, this was the powerful thing. This is what the Holy Ghost taught her, yet. Even the dogs get some crumbs that fall from the table. Get Jesus' analogy. Here's the children, that's the Jews. You're an old Gentile, and they call you dogs. He said, now, it wouldn't be meat, wouldn't be proper, wouldn't in, in regular life nor in spiritual life for me to take the meat that has been given to the children and give it to you. She didn't say, well, who are you calling a dog? She says, I'll take that. But you got to admit, even the crumbs fall down and the dogs eat it. Jesus, I don't even want everything you're giving to Israel. All I need from you is just a little crumb. Now, when you ask Jesus for the crumb, he'll give you the whole loaf of bread. He said, woman, I wanted to show these Jews what faith looks like. You see, I've just told you the truth straight up, and you received it. I've been telling them the truth for days, and they're going to put me on a cross. And she came and worshiped. See, she had discernment given to her by the Holy Spirit of God. Well, of course, Jesus told her in verse 28, she recognized where she was. She saw what he could do, and he says, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And, of course, her daughter was made whole from that hour, the need that she came to him for. But undoubtedly, that day when she recognized who he was, not only did her daughter get healed, I expect to see that woman in heaven because she listened to the Word of God. You know, today what we need, and we have it at our disposal, is the truth. If you don't know Jesus, he's willing to give you the truth. If you are, are saved, we've got a powerful tool that's called the truth. I uh, heard the story of a pastor that actually, I, I know he's not living now, but years ago, he was saying, this was probably in the late 70s, early 80s, and of course the hippie movement was strong then, and he had a couple of hippies that walked into his church on a Sunday morning. It was a small church, they probably 60 or 70 people, something like that, and he saw these two hippies come in, they sat down, and they came in after the service started, but this preacher was the type of guy he loved to talk to people. And, oh, who's these people here? What's your name? Where are you from? And, you know, he would talk to people at, if, even if they came in late. So they came in, slipped in, sat two or three rows in the back. And he said, it was good to have visitors here. I'm glad to have. Um, where are you ladies from? Well, one of them was a man. One of them was a woman. It was a married couple. He thought one of I mean, literally, they had hair down their back. It was straight and matted. I mean, it was sort of like oily and just, they looked a little, but he's, uh, where are you ladies from? Totally sincere. One of them was a man, one of them was a woman. Of course, they told the story later. Now you think, oh man, that's going, now that was an accident. And they realized that. Could have already made him a little bit uncomfortable, but they heard the gospel that day. When they heard the gospel, what could have been a, 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 certainly a sincere mistake didn't keep them. They came that day looking for something, and they found it. You know, that guy today is a preacher, and they're in the ministry up in North Carolina. Lives changed by the power of God. Now, he wasn't necessarily preaching the truth by saying, you two ladies. He wasn't trying to be sarcastic, but it does make the point. Is the gospel, what they need is they need the truth, and that's what the world needs today. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Lord, we're thankful today for your word and for the opportunity to read what the word of God has to say. 
Lord, I know many of us have trusted Christ and we're thankful today that we know you, that we're on our way to heaven, but there could be some today that don't have that assurance. They may know about you, but they may question whether or not they really know you and if they're really saved. I pray that you'd work in their heart today, that even today we would have opportunity to see them get that blessed assurance. We pray for believers today that give them a confidence in the truth, help them to move beyond what the world might be saying to them and recognize that the truth is powerful and that we have have it uh, responsibility to give it to them. Lead now, we pray in this invitation time in Jesus' name. Let's stand with our heads.